live from San Jose, California, which is the Cohesity Build Day. My name is Jeffrey Powers behind the controls, and I'm going to turn it over to Alistair and Barath right now. Thanks, Jeffrey. It's uh, awesome to be here in San Jose, just off the end of San Jose International Airport runway. If you hear a little bit of noise from uh, outside the room, it's probably planes flying over. None of them have yet uh, got too close to the building. I'm Alistair Cook, and joining me for uh, this wonderful Build Day Live with Cohesity is... Dang it, I've, I've slipped his last name. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> We had this conversation. I, I was <laughs> should have written it on the on the whiteboard in front of me. Um, <laughs> it is Barath. Welcome, man. And what's your role with with Cohesity? Thanks for having me, Alistair. Uh, it's a blessing to be a part of this event. Obviously, uh, my name is Bharat Nagaraj. Uh, I'm a, a systems engineer here at Cohesity. Um, I primarily work in uh, Bay Area, uh, East Bay, and uh, handle customers on the side. So quite a lot of direct contact with customers, hands-on, out doing field deployments, how they strike issues. And uh, this week, as you've been helping me, you've also been helping customers with their escalations. Yeah. So it's one of the things we like is to get somebody who has hands-on experience out in the field to come in and help us through, and particularly to show the process that you'll get as you deploy a cohesity solution. So what's our, our general plan at the moment is that we have a four node cluster that is uh, not quite racked and stacked because we're here in a meeting room. So it's yeah, sitting there with right there, right? the uh, mobile lab is, is attached to it. And we're going to deploy that out and start protecting some virtual machines, protecting some other data, and then have a look at actually doing operational tasks while that protection's in, in process, and then doing some restores and looking at some other parts of the, the platform. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So that's a, a C21. Uh, 2515, I think, and uh, yeah, it'll be um, good to kind of show the simplicity of the platform and uh, how quickly, you know, we can get a rack stack and install regardless of the size and and a lot of times when I actually speak to the customers, they don't really understand until we actually show them. So um, yeah, it'll be good to kind of go through the entire process. Cool. Well, should we take a quick look at the lab environment and also the preparation document because an important part of the deployment process is to gather some information ahead and make sure your settings are right and, and you have the information you need. Yep. So this is the same lab environment that we've been using in past Build Day Live events. It's a two-node um, vSAN environment with our third node that runs the management cluster. We've got a few virtual machines running there at the moment. Quite an impressive portable lab you have, Alistair. <laughs> it's, it's an amazing amount of tech in a checked bag that I travel around the world with. Now, when we first started this engagement, um, we took a, look at, um, took a look at the spreadsheet that you use as part of the initial engagement. And this is not something that's off the public website, but all of the field engineers, people like yourself who go out and help customers, will bring this as part of the initial engagement. Yeah, That's so typically before we're uh, we're on site, um, probably a week before either me or a professional services engage, uh, engagement person from Cohesity will walk the customer through what all are the requirements. As you can see, it's quite detailed from, uh, from the networking standpoint, the cabling standpoint, and all the pre-work needed as well. And the idea is that, you know, we reduce any amount of human error. So we actually gather every input that we need to we need to put, not that there's that many uh, to be added there. But uh, yeah, uh, so if we get the preparation right, then it, it, the process is smoother than uh, Yeah, so good preparation is the way to, yeah. to head into a good deployment. So we are deploying a C2000 series mm -hmm. with four nodes using SFP Plus. We've just got DAC cables connecting to my 10 gig switch. Uh, the nodes are currently built at 6.1.1D, which is the current long-term support release, which yep. is good. Uh, we have uh, Build Day Live as our cluster name, but it's going to be referred to as BDL, so we'll use BDL as the cluster name throughout. That should work. Uh, standard passwords throughout, although I wouldn't recommend that in production. <laughs> Uh, what else have we got in here? And on this side, we have information about the power requirements and cabling. Mm -hmm. So the 10 gig SFP plus and the four one gig Ethernet on this particular 
uh, deployment. We're talking about that, although there's one gig network adapters in the physical nodes, you typically don't use those. Yeah, we don't. Uh, we dip, most of the storage traffic is routed through the 10 gig uh, cables at the back. And uh, that's where the virtual uh, IP interface comes into play as well. So uh, typically the only one gig that we deal with is for the IPM, IBMC control. Right. And we have those, mm -hmm. those wired up as well. Uh, I think that was the end of the our configuration in here. So our network configuration is that we're sending the network we're going to work over as being sent untagged into the, cl the cluster. Mm -hmm. Um, that's the simplest configuration, makes our job easier at, at yep. deployment time. But what's the support for VLAN tagging for doing the storage traffic? Yeah, we can support VLAN tagging on our uh, cluster. And uh, that's typically some of the information that we kind of collect right up front. And just from a, a typical initial node discovery standpoint, I, I like to keep the, switch, uh, the switches in the most simplest configuration as possible. Uh, typically when the idea is that you know uh, regardless of the number of blocks and nodes you have I want to be able to uh, discover all of the nodes through that one node so uh, typically I move that to a access mode so um, I can basically see all the traffic coming through and I can see all the nodes but we can work with some complexities in the networking if, if there if is. Customers have some some requirements in there and then we have the uh, IP address schema for the, the cluster that we have. Mm -hmm. So we have a node IP and we have a virtual IP. Mm -hmm. Can you talk through the differentiation between those two as well? Yes, a node IP is mainly for management purposes. Uh, they both uh, sort of share the same nick at the back. Um, the IPMI obviously is the BMC uh, control for the, uh, for the servers that we have. Uh, the important one is the virtual IP. And, and that's the uh, crux of our distributed architecture and load balancing that happens through these IP addresses. So uh, these IP addresses sort of float around uh, with different nodes, which is why we can kind of do non-disruptive upgrades and we are much more uh, tuned for node failures when there is active tasks going on because uh, these are the, uh, the the VIP, the virtual IPs are the storage IPs that the uh, that the source and the uh, and your VMware environments and your physical environments deal with uh, during traffic. So the node IPs are attached to the physical mm -hmm. appliance, whereas the virtual IP can float. Normally, sits one to one relationship, but yep. if there's any kind of failure, that virtual IP can move. Yep, you got that on the head. Nice. Yeah. And there, there is in this spreadsheet a lot more information that uh, we've made sure is right, but this is the one piece, this one page is really the data collection that's specific to the site. There's a lot of um, workflow and configuration information in there as well. Yeah, so uh, some of the other details are firewalls, um, you know, the, the exact diagram of the cabling itself, and, uh, you know, so the customer has exact idea of what we're going to do, and uh, some more other uh, pre-work that, um, that we do. And this spreadsheet normally then stays with the customer as a record of what was built and and a, a future rebuild as well, if that's required. And we keep an, we keep a, copy, keep a copy just of uh, so that everyone's on the same page. Okay. Well, we have the configuration we're going to build out. What's our first step to configuring the cluster? All right. So um, what we uh, what people can see is that we actually have the cluster right here, and uh, on the cluster is a tag that has the uh, the cluster SSN which is unique to uh, all the OECD clusters that we ship. And what we need to do is basically uh, using our MacBook or, uh, or a Windows laptop, connect to the Ethernet port at the back of any of the nodes. We're going to basically connect to node 1. So if I grab this mm -hmm. URL here, and it's a standard form. We've just put a, a node. Uh, I put the cluster ID in here, and so it's this this piece in the middle here. Yeah, that's the uh, that's the unique uh, SSN basically. That's mm -hmm. that's the piece. It's it's not the serial number of of the block, but it's it's the identifying number that's used by the um, the Avahi uh, serverless DNS. Perfect. Yes. So I can connect to that and proceed. Initial right. configuration is this is the admin admin. This is the uh, whoop, admin and uh, admin. admin typed correctly. Yep. And and typically, if I uh, if 
I have my switch configuration in the right mode and my networking is working fine, then I should be seeing the number of nodes that I've actually racked and stacked up on my in my data center. So uh, if I have eight blocks, then that would translate to you know 32 nodes, all of which I should see through this um, one login over here. So this is the first stage of validation, well, second stage of validation. The first stage of validation is we can connect to the, the name, the second stage is to see that we've got the right number of chassis and nodes mm -hmm. in there. So I guess I get started in here, and there's my four nodes, and I want them all in one cluster. I guess in a large deployment, you know, if I've got eight blocks and there's 32 nodes, I might be building multiple clusters for multiple purposes in there. Yeah, so we have uh, customers that do a different kind of uh, use cases. The, our, our whole cell is that we can, we can deal with heterogeneous workloads on a single cluster. But we do have some segregations around, you know, VM, uh, virtual machine, uh, protect versus scale out NAS and things right. like that. So, But I'll take all four. Mm -hmm. And then I need to put in some addresses. So the IPMI addresses have been inherited from uh, the existing configuration. And uh, all these fields have an autofill in. Uh, well, they don't all have autofill in. Because <laughs> um, we've tried running this before. There we go. And that's all simply the addresses that I took out of that spreadsheet. So that should match up to the addresses on the node IPs mm -hmm. and the IPMI addresses in here. Cool. And we go continue to cluster settings. And it says, what else do we need to know from my cluster? Well, this one is going to be called build there live. It is going to be under lab.local domain. Subnet gate. I like this remembering of data that I entered <laughs> before because typing this is not the most exciting thing to do. Admin and admin again. We should not stick with those. DNS. That would be an optional field in search domains. If you have other search domains in your network, you want to add that. Otherwise, the the input that you added for the cluster domain would be the uh, oh, missing. Was entry. always included. Yeah. Yeah. And then I can add my domain controller in here as my DNS server and also as my time server. You're saying that the time server is really important to us, that things go badly wrong if this isn't correctly configured. Yeah, like, uh, as we're a completely distributed architecture, so uh, our health relies on all of these nodes uh, being in time sync. So um, having the right time uh, NTP server is very important for that so that the clusters are basically in, in sync throughout. Uh, typically in deployments, um, you know, customers can use something like pool.ntp.org as well, uh, something which if uh, that's work, worked reliably in large deployments. Or if they have a reliable time server, uh, then I would, I, would, I would just pause and make sure that we have that right. And then my cluster host name, mm -hmm. we're going to do bdl.lab.local and my virtual IP addresses, we're getting those, 61. Through good at remembering IP addresses. Well, <laughs> you know, I did define all the IP address <laughs> ranges in here. Now, you're saying we, we should actually verify this beforehand, so you'd normally do a name lookup of that host name. So let's do that now. Yeah, this is this is uh, this this is one of the pre work that is included in the pre installed checklist, where we give the customer steps to basically add this round robin DNS entry on their DNS server. There it is. Yep, and. So this is very important because, again, a distributed architecture and um, we want to basically, at the point in time of ingest, all the data basically goes to all of these nodes. So, and this kind of comes in during node failures and upgrades as well. So we can seamlessly do some of these otherwise disruptive operations in, you know, in other similar architectures here. We can basically, if we have this right, then, uh, you know, if in case there is one node failure, the, the, the system will Continue operating operate. without any, you know, hiccups. And of course, we plan for a um, node failure fairly regularly um, in terms of doing things like updates and and maintenance is going to cause a, a failover. Yep. Um, and that's just a routine, normal activity. 
Yeah, that's a, that's a beauty about the design that our engineers built. A failure was a norm in almost every uh, platform essences of whatever we have on um, in our in our product. So yeah, it's that idea that if you're not planning for failure, then you're planning to fail. Mm -hmm. And if failure is routine, the component failure is routine, but the service continues to operate. Uh, option down here for encryption. Yeah. So typically, uh, this is a cluster level encryption setting. Now, the different granular levels of encryption that you can add with Cohesity. Uh, if your compliance is that you know you want encryption on everything that lands on Cohesity from a cluster standpoint, you want to put this option to be on right at the start. But it is currently a one-time set option. Uh, if if compliance is not that strong and you want to basically apply en encryption at rest at different granularities, we allow that by doing that at the storage domain layer. Of course, you know when we have external targets and when we move data to the cloud, you can do uh, an encryption at flight on a per object basis as well. So different levels of granularity, but in you know it's just flexibility as well. Right. So this is the least flexible, most strictly enforced encryption option would be to choose to encrypt the entire cluster. That's correct. Right. And that's FIPS 142 as well. So we, we could choose it. in here to use FIPS compliant. Okay. I'm not going to turn on encryption because I don't think there's, yeah. there's a lot of value in it for us. So I just create the cluster. And I guess that at this point there's a lot of side-to-side -side communication amongst those four nodes. There'll be uh, starting to uh, establish connectivity and uh, build out the cluster. Yeah, okay. we should, yes. There we go, we've got some progress and uh, I think that's going to be a, a fairly uninteresting mm -hmm. uh, progress for a, a little while. Thank you Jeffrey. Uh, now we have our cluster has completed setup, so it's, it's sitting here, sitting at the uh, uh, ready to, to go on. Let's take a, a little look at the details of what the cluster build process did. And we can see that there's been quite a lot has gone on in terms of configuring the nodes and uh, setting NTP on them and starting services in here. But it didn't take a huge amount of time to, to complete out. It was actually done about halfway through that video, so uh, <laughs> it's uh, nicely uh, completed out. And it says go and, and hit one of the IP addresses, and presumably that's the IP address that what's physically node one has, has taken. Uh, so there isn't quite a, a direct correlation between the physical node slot in the box and the node number on the cluster that's been applied. That's that's not a tightly enforced relationship. No, it is enclosure. Uh, it's uh, it's I guess whichever node finishes the quickest would take become the node one basically. But that's uh, it, it's just the beauty of distributed architectures. So. And in the end, they're all just equal partners. They're not, mm -hmm. There isn't one primary node or anything going on in here. Exactly. Still the default password at this stage. Yes, I think I might read through this license agreement, maybe download it and use it to help me get to sleep tonight. <laughs> uh, but I'll just agree to it. Then I need to enter a license key. And the license key I have is a actual production one. So Jeffrey, can we just switch to camera while I copy and paste in my license key? All right, that one's it. So what's the process that we actually receive that uh, license key as we're doing this deployment? Uh, typically, we um once the cluster is set up, uh, we, we will have that key ready to go for a particular customer. Um, or if we're doing some kind of a remote install, then I provide that through Salesforce, basically. Right, so it, it comes in through your um, Cohesit ESE is going to provide that information yeah. for you. Right. So what have we got in our front screen? We've got our dashboard for our BDL cluster here. Yeah, this is our 611D latest version. Um, typically, uh, the, the intention for this is to sort of be a single pane of glass um, as we kind of 
go through uh, different stages of it though. But in essence, this will give you a, uh, a summary of you know, what your protection runs look like, uh, how many runs have succeeded, how many SLA violations you've had, as typically some of the data around data protect that customers are very interested in, uh, and also storage reduction and dedupe ratio. You know, we doubt that you know, we, we actually do global variable and deduplication. We handle all of these different heterogeneous workloads, so we actually get more um, room in the storage as compared to some of the others in the market. So, uh, seeing some you know good numbers out there always uh, is you know helps us. So, and of course, this is not very interesting since the clusters <laughs> only been up for five minutes. Uh, but over time, that will get to be a, a more useful console for us. Yeah. What else can we see in here just in terms of the, the current state of the environment? Where would I go to, to look at some details of what I have? Right, so where we are at right now is we just installed the cluster, so we want to know if all the nodes are healthy and what my ultimate, or what my storage capacity available would look like. So I would go to uh, platform and click on cluster. And this gives you the cluster summary in terms of how much total usable you have. Uh, the hardware model, the number of nodes, um, and you can kind of dig deeper into some of the configurations that we've added, like you know the default partition that would give you uh, the you know all, all of your virtual IP addresses is information, um, and one of the other pieces is the cluster ID as well, uh, which our support channel will base. If you if you if we enable the support channel, then they can do. Uh, SSH and uh, for troubleshooting purposes if need be. So some of those details are fairly important. Um, the other details are storage domain if you actually go to the next tab. Um, and this in essence is the, um, is the scope of our, um, of our uh, data reduction policies that's around global deduplication and, and, and compression, right? So uh, remember we're speaking about different granularities of encryption. Uh, this is uh, one level at which you can set encryption to be yes or no. Um, and we can also do cloud tier option and change redundancy options on the fly as we kind of uh, add data to the cluster. So the, so what, one of the things I wanted to, to clarify is we talk about this as being the, a storage domain as the scope of the data reduction policy. Mm -hmm. But not the actual, you know, if I turn on deduplication for multiple uh, storage domains, it's global across all of those storage domains that, that I get deduplication. It's not constrained to just the, the actual scope of deduplication isn't just one storage domain. Typically, uh, the way customers configure is they, they in most of my deployments, they have one storage domain. And this is a storage domain that, uh, you know, it, it has all the metadata uh, tagging. And when we actually do a data transfers to the cloud or secondary side, the handshakes happen between st storage domains. So this is the scope of the global data reduction per se. If, and this happens very rarely, but it does happen where you want to have workloads that do not dedupe at all. Uh, I, I, I push the customer to keep it within the storage domain. It doesn't really affect you but you could have multiple storage domain right. if need be for certain workflows that do not dedupe at all or have completely different uh, data policies. There may be some encryption. compliance regimes that don't allow uh, data reduction technologies. That, that's right. But no technical reason not to, mm -hmm. to contain them it, together. Yeah, no technical reason why we, we can't handle all of it in one, right? And some of the other other pieces are uh, if you go to the nodes that gives you uh, what the you know uh, when we're actually doing node upgrades and things like that this will give you a point in time update on you know uh, what the status of the node is if it's upgrading what versions at uh, you can kind of track that over here and you if you want to add more VLANs and other networking configurations we have that tab there as well. Correct. Okay, so it looks like our cluster is up and healthy, has the four nodes we expected. Uh, what's our next process? Um, actually, one of the one of the values that we uh, that I try to provide, you know, in proof of concepts or during deployments, how fast we can get to action, right? Um, so I, I typically spend uh, about an hour or two with the data center at most. Uh, if the install is as smooth as how it was today, it's probably going to be thirty minutes, apart from the rack stacking and the adding of the uh, network cable process. But I want to be, you know, uh, at the 
at my customer's desk as soon as possible, showing him the value soon. So what I do uh, to begin with actually is to jump into a protection, uh, jump into a policy and, uh, and show the ease of setup uh, that we bring to the table. So into the policy manager? Mm -hmm. You click on the policy manager. We give you three cookie cutter policies, but more often than not, every business has its own frequency of, you know, or what, uh, the, what the frequency of the backup should be and the retention policy. But, you know, we do a little more than that. Uh, if we can pick a policy of your choice and then uh, and kind of dig in a little bit more deeper. Well, let's there. look at gold. I always like gold. <laughs> All right, so what you see over here in the screen is the first thing you see is the frequency of backup, right? So uh, we actually have all of this conversation right up front because when we actually size for the capacity that you have, we take into account what the frequency of backups are, how long the retentions are, and what your other compliance extended retentions need to be uh, are as well. So it's just a matter of kind of taking that from our our, our theory and just basically adding that over here from a policy standpoint. And the idea here is it's one time set and leave. So we don't want to um, really come over here and keep changing uh, parameters on a daily basis. Uh, we define the strategy right up front and we implement the strategy, right? And um, right, so you can change it to a policy that works for you, Alistair. Well, my gold highest protection policy, I maybe want to be backing things up more than six times a day. Maybe I, I'm mm -hmm. going to take my backup time down to two hours. Um, and retention means that I'm keeping every one of those two hourly backups for seven days before any of them are being cleaned out. That is correct. Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a local retention policy over here. As we kind of scroll down, we'll get a little more granular on you know, what else we can do there. And you notice the ad log backup there. And the idea there is that, you know, you could have this policy applied to your VMware or your Hyper-V protection jobs, but also involve your SQL and your Oracle to kind of follow a similar policy. So I can well. have one policy that applies to both virtual machine backups and uh, physical database server backups in this case? Yes, uh, one policy for, I mean, if, if that works within your business use case. It, you can apply this policy for all your workloads, right? Right. I've got, well, I can leave log backups in there as well. And then I've got an extended retention. So although I've got a seven-day, hour, uh, two-hourly granularity for my full backups, I've also got multiple days worth of daily, weekly, monthly yep. in there. And presumably I can add uh, maybe every, uh, what have we got down to every year, uh, every one year retain for, uh, let's say I've got to do 10 years. I could do pretty long retention. It seems to be loud in here and mm -hmm. presumably it's it's infinite retention if we um, lock it for compliance purposes. Oh yeah, so we, you actually have a data lock switch right, at, right up uh, at the top so you can even basically lock all of your snapshots so it's never, you know, uh, destroyed. But these are typically for compliance and you know legal purposes where you want these uh, cookie cutter snapshots that's for weeks, some months, and years. Yep. Yeah, fit with your corporate data governance in here. And uh, one of the other options is a, you know, you can actually set up a blackout window as well as a part of your policy. Uh, this is typically with customers who do not want traffic on their storage network during high peak hours uh, or they're, they're using the shared kind of a storage network and, and it's, it's, very, it's very congested to begin with. So we can add some alleviation there and kind of work around a customer's environment by using these blackout windows. But presumably we're trying to avoid that because if the blackout window is long, we can get a situation where we're not compliant with our backup policy because the backout window has, has stopped that. Correct, yeah. Right. And that for me is, is one of the things I love about policy-based management is, is that I set the policy and know that it is being enacted and I only have to deal with the exceptions rather than having to watch every execution to see that they're compliant with policy. Correct. And replication and archive and cloud spin, we're, we're not going to hit quite yet. 
Right, but, but it is also kind of interesting though because uh, you know apart from the policy being just the frequency of how long we do, how quick, how quick, how soon we do backups and things like that, you are also defining the strategy of you know what the what the data mobility looks like, right? And uh, we'll get to it later, obviously, with our cloud agnostic architecture. But the idea is that we can actually move data from one site to another for DR purposes. Uh, you know, you can set that as a at, at the policy level, right? And so I'm only having one impact to my production storage for both data protection and disaster recovery and compliance archiving. Yes, and uh, our customers find that as a as a very simplistic model to kind of design their data strategy as well. Again, it's a whole lot of governance around the applications and the data which drives setting these policies. So if I just save up my change, making the uh, gold policy a little more aggressive than it was, we're all in place. Sweet. Now, uh, now we'll look at what we want to back up in your environment, Alistair. Okay. I want to back up my vSphere environment. All right. Let's, uh, again, go to protection, and then you'll have a sources link there. And what you want to do is go to your top right corner and do register um, hypervisor. And here is where, you know, you could choose uh, if you actually go, scroll down, you can see vCenter, we can add ESXi host, um, Hyper-V, but for us even, you know, even, even cloud subscriptions be, uh, is treated as a hypervisor as well. Interesting, that, that we can back up from the on-premises appliance some, some resources sitting up in, in AWS. Oh yes, yeah, if, uh, if we have a good enough bandwidth between the cloud and on-premise, it's, uh, it's a complete possibility. Put in some credentials for my uh, vSphere environment. Uh, and I'm just going to trust the existing certificate. And yeah, we've, add, uh, we've added some, uh, some more switches here to, to kind of tune to a, um, a vSphere environment. Um, you know, sometimes it's uh, not fully loaded, but in a lot of enterprises, you have a lot of, lot of things going on. So. You know, I just noticed the second from the bottom one of auto cancel backups of data stores running low on space, and that's going to be really important because uh, whenever we're taking a, a backup function at some point, there's going to be an increase in the consumption of space on the data store, and the last thing we want is the backups to be the thing that runs us out of space. That's a very cool setting to have in here. Yeah, for us, uh, I think every strand of our uh, our design is based on keeping resiliency. So. That's something that you will find common with Cohesity. Yeah, the only thing worse than not having a backup is not having production. <laughs> yeah. And so I've typed something wrong in here, and I think it's that I didn't type my password correctly. I forgot it was a slightly more complex password. This time, happier. So now I've got my vCenter server and it's got 33 unprotected virtual machines. It's probably not the sedate that we want to uh, live in. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you want to kind of jump right in and create a protection job. So that'll be under protection and protection jobs. There you go. Right. And you want to protect uh, virtual servers. So one that always trips me as I'm going through this, this user interface is that the job, the name of the thing that I'm creating uh, has to be set first. I'm usually leaping onto the details yeah. behind. Uh, so I'm going to do uh, gold folder as my name because I know that I'm going to be protecting with the gold policy all of the VMs in a particular folder. Yep. And so then we're going to select it as being our vCenter server. And nice search. Yeah, so we give you uh, quite a bit of latitude in terms of how you want to search for your objects. Uh, if you want it at a very simplistic, you know, setup that you want to basically back up all of your assets of your uh, of your virtual center for the perpetuity of all the VMs that come in, you have an auto protect option right to the right corner over there. And as soon as you click that, you'll see that every object underneath that particular hierarchy will get auto protected, and any virtual machine that basically comes in at a later point will be auto protected. But you can also kind of dig into some more granular stuff. Um, you know, you can search for a particular tag. Um, you see the search bar right there. Um, and you can search for a, basically a keyword, like I see a bunch of launches. If you just do, 
LAUNC and then it basically filters down to all the uh, launchers that you have and then you can auto protect again at the highest level but while applying the search key that you provided. Right. Well I wanted to protect things by folders rather than their names. Mm -hmm. So I was going to come in and have a look in my folder hierarchy and find the folder in here. And this is exposing the names that are used internally in vCenter, uh, which is why we get this VM folder in here. Yeah. But I'm going to take this desktops folder here that contains 10 virtual machines and I'm going to auto protect that. Yeah. So that means any new VM added to this desktops pool, uh, folder is going to get, uh, get added to my protection. Yep, um, and it's a it's a full VADP API integration. So, uh, for the largest segment, 90, 95%, 96% of your infrastructure is agentless from a, from right. a backup standpoint, and it applies to Hyper-V as well. So. And I want to protect with that goal policy that I just changed, and I want to place that on my default storage domain since there is only one. Mm -hmm. And then we get some more detail around when this policy, sh this backup protection job should f end, never. <laughs> and we have QoS policies. Um, what are they about for customers? Right, so uh, QoS is, it gives you some granular control on what your performance should look like. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't really, um, you know, tune it as much in normal circumstances. But in scenarios where you have, you know, seven to eight different kinds of heterogeneous workloads, it gives customers some level of control on priorities. So if you want, you know, a more, you know, more shares from a flash perspective, then you can change that QoS to backup SSD. Then, uh, you know, your ingest will become quite a bit more faster. But typically, I don't really mess with it because the performance that we get in more circumstances is very sufficient. So you let the underlying system manage it. Yeah. Rather than doing this yourself. We've got exclusions and app consistency, so that, that will be using over quiescing. Yeah. And for Windows, the um, volume shadow copy integration. Correct, yeah, that's uh, that's typically for app consistency. We can basically talk to the uh, VMware agent on the system that can help us get a, uh, the VSS copy. Um, and that'll apply to databases and applications. And, and then there's indexing control. So once, once the backup's done, are we going to index all of the content yeah. as well? Correct. So or we do this at the uh, at a virtual machine object level as well as what we call as views or data stores. But yeah, it's enabled by default. Um, but the idea is that you know sometimes you don't want certain pieces to be indexed as well. So we've added this particular uh, setting over here, so you can go in and choose you know uh, a part of your. Um, file path that you do not want to get indexed. There may be somewhere that has a high churn rate of temp files that you don't want indexed. Waste, it's a waste of time to, to index the temp files that are going to be deleted anyway. Yep, and we, are, we actually have some of those uh, I can see exclusions, exclusions already in place. In place yeah. right. All right, well, let's start protecting those 10 machines and that job starts. Uh, while that's going, why don't we protect some other things as well? Uh, I'm going to protect some more virtual machines, and this is going to be uh, tag, and I'm going to use bronze priority. So this time, instead of using a uh, object filter, I'm going to use a tag, and yep. just select here the bronze protection tag. So I've got some virtual machines that have the bronze protection tag. I sit, sit it there as as uh, Auto protect on bronze, and you can see that three virtual machines. Are. So I have three VMs with that tag applied. A lot of my customers they really like that option because they want to they want to actually make they already have tags at the VMware vCentral level. So for us to basically seamlessly integrate to that means that it's lesser management overhead when you're because it, it, to think about you know the systems over the past six seven years to kind of deal with virtual center and the different objects. It's not really easy. Uh, no matter what circumstances, mm. we try to kind of bring some method to the madness there with this uh, user interface, and hopefully it's it's been easy so far. And if we've been using tagging to categorize the criticality of our applications, we can use that criticality tag to drive the data protection tag as well, uh, data protection activities as well. Exactly. Yeah. Cool. Well, I'll add them, and I said I wanted the bronze policy on those, and again, default storage domain. 
and let's protect that. Cool, bunch of protection. Let's uh, one final protection. I want to select a particular uh, a particular machine. It's actually the domain controller that I'm RDP connected into to do all of the demo. I'm going to protect just that one machine, which we'll find in the management folder under host zero. Uh, better yet, why don't I just search for it because I know it's called DC. There it is, one virtual machine. While he's doing that, we actually do have a question from the uh, chat, and the question is, what happens if you have a machine, let's say one machine's in the gold policy, one machine's in the bronze policy, it's kind of overlooked, will it go for the the better one, or will it uh, will it move to the lighter one, or which which one will it go to? Yeah, what happens if we have multiple protection jobs that include the same um, object, the same virtual machine? Yeah, I think uh, from a um, so when we are actually once once we actually have a VM as a part of a policy, when we actually go into our user interface, it gives a notification saying that it is already being protected. So first of all, just preventing you from actually doing an operation like that. But if we were to, if you if you want it for some reason, then it's uh, you know it should work fine. There is it'll basically run on both policies because uh, maybe there was a business. Uh, requirement is associated to it being protected on both different policies. I mean, one of the things that might go on is that the virtual machine might have two different tags on it, mm -hmm. one of which says it's a critical infrastructure server and one of which says it's part of an application, and those might drive two different protection policies. You're right, yeah. But I guess what you'd get is the combination of the two sets of protection. So mm -hmm. if it was one of the protection policies said, we want to protect every four hours, the other said every two hours, well, every two hours is going to cover your every four hours requirement. Correct. And uh, since all of these, uh, when, we, when we kind of uh, reconstruct our whole logical uh, build that we have around our global deduplicated file system, uh, it will be faster as well because we already have those blocks. So um, our, you could probably do that and it will be very quick in terms of just creating a snapshot of it. So now we have some backups in progress, some protection going on. Uh, what we were going to do was show that we can do non-disruptive operations. So we're currently using the 6.1. Was it in my cluster nodes information? Everybody's on 6.1.1 D release. Uh, that's the current long-term support release. So if I come across into the uh, this is the support site, and if I go into my downloads, uh, this should show me that the there we go, current long-term support releases, the 6.1.1D that yep. we're working with. So that's what you'd recommend customers run. Mm -hmm. Yep, uh, long-term releases, um, yeah, that, that's a good version to be on. Uh, but you know, every now and then you have certain customers that have specific uh, features associated to their business use case. That's when we kind of qualify them for some other releases that would be specific to that. And that's this feature releases where I have access to version 6.2 and we wanted to show some of the features that are coming in version 6.2 yep and one of the things we wanted to show was the upgrade process right and uh, the kind of workflow that we're kind of doing here Alistair is is um, you know is kind of like a pro proof of concept process that I go through as well um, you know having the ability to do backups having the ability to have your system functional while doing upgrades is uh, is one of our you know our unique properties. Well, I think uh, before that, so where we get back to our dash note, we are good on there. Before that, those protection jobs finish, we should show that we can do the upgrade non-disruptively. So we've got a few minutes to get that started. OK. What's yeah, the upgrade okay. process look like? Oh, very simple. Uh, typically, uh, I've actually let my customers you know, do the upgrades themselves with a single click of a button. Uh, what you want to do is uh, go to platform, oh, platform or admin, sorry, admin, and then say upgrade cluster. And uh, we basically say get new package, right? So we give you two options, one for customers that do not have internet access on their clusters, so they can basically bring in the package from another area and then basically upload it. Or if you have internet connectivity, it will download the package from the support site as well. And I've previously downloaded from the support site, so I'm just going to upload now. That download was so that the we wouldn't wait for that. Right. 
and uh, here's the uh, here's where the beauty of the the distributed architecture kind of kicks in now because we're kind of uh, tuned for each of these nodes to basically upgrade themselves and if a reboot is required or a re-imaging is required it can take care of that you can actually hear the cluster kind of the working cluster through spin, that spinning <laughs> up its, its fans it's not a plane that is a, uh... <laughs> yeah so uh yeah so you know we're, we're backing up uh you know when we, the upgrade happens and if a reboot is required then at most you lose that bandwidth coming from that one node but at no point you're you're at you know serious risk of your SLA in any standpoint. So if if there is a uh, if throughput on ten gig networks is uh, across the nodes is likely to be a limiting factor. You design for n plus one. Yep. To allow that plus one, or you may even design for n plus two in a large environment to allow for a physical failure during an upgrade. Yep. And and and. That's the kind of conversation I have with the customers. That's game changing because for us, it's it's you know we our architecture does not have like uh, centralized bottlenecks at different segments. The idea is you know what is your SLA and we'll scale to that SLA to kind of give you uh, the throughput and bandwidth you need. Now while I've got this tab monitoring the upgrade, it's connected to the forty fourth uh, node address. Mm -hmm. When that node reboots, my console is going to go away. So I should Correct. probably connect to. The, uh, I'm going to connect to the, the DNS name, bdl.lab.local. Uh, no, it doesn't want to give me that. Let me try that again. Yeah, there are two ways you can do it. Uh, you can either connect to the, uh, the, the DNS name itself, or you can connect to no, um, doesn't like it. the VIP app, um, IP address as well. Yeah, so. The IP is going to take a moment to negotiate the HTTPS. Let's just check in on the cluster upgrade. So, uh, uh, where am I going? Cluster upgrade. So, the cluster upgrade is in progress. Uh, I've got something wrong in there. Let's go for 64. What I did want to show was the protection job still in operation while we're doing this upgrade. So yep. we're, uh, that mm -hmm. gold policy is completed. It's taking a little longer to back up my uh, domain controller that we're connected to. And that upgrade is still in progress. What have we got? So we get detailed progress for each of the nodes. Yeah, this is uh, this is a pretty interesting one as well because it actually will um, give you the logs of what's happening on each of those nodes from a central console. And uh, and as soon as if you actually go if you actually go down, you can actually see the different nodes being. Uh, you know, at different stages of the upgrade as well. So suddenly we've got more progress here on this node that it's it's away and doing things. Yeah. You know, when we did this uh, in the the test, the uh, upgrade process took a little while to run through, and um, as you can see, the the uh, protection job still in operation. All right. Just as that happened, we got uh, we got the. It's speeding up there. So uh, we do have a question on the chat uh, from ETJNY. Uh, is there support for MS Exchange and AD granular backup and restore? They are on 6.2 due to their VMware encrypted servers. So we do have, um, I think the granular part of it I can follow up later, but we do have an integration for Exchange as well as Office 365 Exchange as well. Yeah. And you can hear that our upgrade is progressing. You've seen the heard the whining of the fan. <laughs> and if we take a look at the uh, upgrade process, we'll see that there we go. Show tasks. We'll see one of the nodes has gone through. Lots and lots of detail of what it's been doing as it does the upgrade. Lots and lots. That's still the first node, uh, and now moved moved on to the second node as yeah. the first one is completed out. I'm going to hide, hide out 
the first node. Yeah, a lot of our um, customers who've you know who've used Coisty for more than a year, year and a half, uh, some of the bigger enterprises, you know, they have like 15 node clusters, 17 node clusters. Uh, when the LTS release 611D came out, uh, within the week, basically, we were able to get about 800 clusters into the latest version, and uh, that's possible only because we were actually able to do some of these upgrades during production hours while the system was being used and back, and it was backing up quite like what, what's happening here. So as, as we've been doing that, the protection jobs have been completing, the, the, all three completed out at this stage while it's been doing. So the next thing we wanted to do was to start using a bit of cloud. Mm -hmm. um, we have a GCP uh, storage that we're going to use. So how do I go about adding that to, to my environment? Right. So again, um, focusing on a simplicity and one place to go to kind of change some of these uh, data strategic settings, uh, you, want, you want to first uh, identify your target, so you will add the GCP object storage. So uh, why don't we go to protection job and click on external target. All right. And we'll register this external target. And uh, yeah, so you can do archival or tiering. I'll save tiering for a different conversation. But the idea is that we can connect to all of object storage. Uh, and, and this is primarily for long-term retention is what we're trying to do over here. Uh, we can connect to all of the uh, commercial clouds that are, that's out there, as well as you know if you have any NAS data, uh, NAS data storage that you want to repurpose for long-term retention, we can, and we also have integration to tape. But the idea for long-term retention to cloud is that you know we are trying to give a flexible option for our customers to move off tape to cloud, right? So, in particular, a change from uh, tape-based offsiting mm -hmm. to network delivered. Uh, public cloud offsiting. So we're going to use GCP as regional, mm -hmm. and I have the details kindly provided to me by uh, by Chris Colotti of the GCP bucket that we're going to connect to. So the bucket name is Build Day Live. Look at that! I've even put it in here already. <laughs> oh, the private key won't paste in for me. I better grab that then. Okay, grab that and paste the entire private key, which gives me authentication. Yep. And then uh, actually, will... before you register, if you mm. scroll down a little bit, Alistair, there there's Ooh, some more there's cool more. options here, right? So this is where you know if you want encryption uh, at the object uh, storage level or during flight, and to and if you want to make use of compression, source side deduplication. Uh, we can kind of enable that from a target perspective. Uh, but the things that customers use quite a bit is a bandwidth throttling. Uh, typically, uh, at the time of, uh, you know, like a lot of cust customers either having a WAN connection or a direct connect, they, they want to be able to control how much data goes in and comes out. So you can actually set upload download speeds in terms of, you know, how, when, you know, what, what kind of uh, throttling speed that, um, that you want to send the data out over the wire, and and if you want to do restores, what time you and how you want to basically bring that down, and you can select it on a on a day to day basis and set uh, time windows for these uh, throttling to happen too. And then I can also have multiple throttling windows with different settings yep. as well in there. That looks that looks extremely useful for you're paying for the bandwidth on these links, and you want to get as much business value out of them as you can. Uh, I'm not going to throttle the bandwidth. I'm going to let it go full <laughs> out. Uh, yeah, we, we'll oh, yeah. Oh, i got to name, name it. it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, GCP uh, dash archive. All right. Right. So now I can go back to external targets and I can see it's there. Right. And now, uh, basically, we'll go back to the policy and say, you know what, uh, apart from the local backups that we're doing to this uh, within this policy, uh, we can actually do long-term retention within that as well. So I'll edit my policy here. That's, this is the one that's backing up the mm -hmm. uh, domain controller that I'm sitting on. Uh, this is the one that's got yeah, the same retention, but I can add a archival, presumably, then. Yep. And say I want to archive to GCP archive every 
I want to archive once a day, I think. And I could change the archival time. We're not going to be here for long enough to uh, to see that. And we'll do a Typically, the retention for your long-term retention, uh, well, as the name suggests, right? It's it's going to be uh, you know a, a pretty a large number. And so if it's financial data, it's going to be seven years. Mm -hmm. If it's medical imaging data, it's going to be 120 years. Exactly. Uh, if you ever get stressed about working with financial data retention at seven years, just think about the biomedical where you have to keep data for the entire patient's lifetime plus 20 years. So 120 years of retention is it's a bigger problem. And the uh, idea is that you know, uh, in, as a part of this policy, we're doing frequencies and all that, but also the data strategy around, you know, when we actually send data to these archive targets, they're globally deduped too. So uh, apart from the first first full that goes and sits in your object store, every other uh, snapshot or increments that happen, there's only like a few changes that ex exchanges between your on-premise and your uh, cloud object store. So there's the, the amount of data being transferred is optimized all the way through. Exactly. So, so we'll save that guy out, and it says it'll change, right, we've got a policy applied to a particular machine and it's going to be affected, that's a nice notification. So now we have archive to GCP um, storage, a bucket. Uh, at this time, I'll just show you that bucket. The bucket here is currently completely empty. So this is our build day live uh, bucket. Nothing currently in it. That's what we're archiving to here. You know, I wonder if this node is the one that's currently being. Uh, no, we're on a virtual, so it won't be a single node that's. Uh, yeah, I'll give it a little time. It'll, um, it'll add this. Let's take a look back at our cluster and see how we're going on the upgrade. So the upgrade is continuing along, it's saying we've got about another eight minutes of, of upgrade time. So the first node is done. Second node is still in. Oh, no, this node has has gone through. So it looks like the second node is complete. That looks like a third node. So it looks like we're just finishing three, the third node, and the fourth node will kick off after that. Yeah. Uh, modify policy is taking a little while to save out. Yeah, um, unusual, but uh, it should get done in time. One of the ideas that we kind of look at here is uh, giving customers like a kind of a progressive uh, step to cloud. Um, so typically we start if customers are kind of cloud shy at this point and they they have on premise but they're thinking of of you know moving their data to the cloud long term retention data would be the first start right uh, that gives them sort of like a lazy um, uh, a lazy DR strategy in case there is any uh, you know unforeseen events that happen on your primary site you have the ability to take your archive data and basically seed that to any other CoECD cluster right and of course once it's in a in a cohesity environment on the cloud, then it's all deduped globally and as we start increasing our use, there isn't more data transfers as we change from one type to another necessarily. Correct. Yeah. Well, we're not, still not seeing that complete out. Uh, is it likely to be destructive if I go and have a look at the policy and then read it? No, we can, uh, you can probably refresh the page even. Okay, so that archive hasn't been added. Let's just add it again, just to be sure. Actually, it's probably doing. It's probably in the middle of uh, some upgrade task in doing this. So we can come back to this. If you actually go to um, go to the dashboard and probably see the protection policy, you might even see that being applied already. So where are we going to see that? Then? And just go to policy manager. It might. Okay, it's still not taken in. So. It's still not showing us that. Uh, let me check that the external source is still showing up. Mm -hmm. So definitely the external source is still showing up. And we go and have a look at our policy manager again, and I will edit the silver policy again. And re-add that archive if it's not showing. This is the fun part of uh, doing everything live, isn't it? <laughs> yes, and it's exactly the sort of thing that happens in, in the real world as well. Yeah. 
There we go. That time it completed quickly, and now we've got Nikon beside the um, protection policy saying that it's kind of archived to cloud. So that's a cool thing, right? Uh, so uh, you can actually have multiple archive targets too, so uh, and multiple replicated targets. And uh, thanks to our engineers and our UI design, right? When we actually look at a policy, you you, you can ho you, you already know what's happening with your data. It's doing local protection. It's doing archive to cloud. I can get that by just looking at this particular screen. Right, and then. Um what we wanted to do was actually kick that off and make it happen. We don't want to wait another 12 hours since we've already mm -hmm. had that uh, protection policy applied. So I was going to run now. Yeah, uh, so the run now is a, is, a, is a particularly interesting operation where it allows you to basically get a do a backup job right now or get a snapshot right now. It, it helps in scenarios where, and, and all of what you're doing right now is API driven. And a lot of use cases that I have with my customers is like, oh, my, my DBA wants to run this backup at his time and hour, or he has this script to which I want to just give him an API and get him a CoECD snapshot done. Uh, I typically basically uh, point them to the browser, just do a backup now, copy paste the URL or API to the script, and they're up and running. Right. And this, this could be even the operations team are about to make a significant change to a virtual machine, and we want to know that right now mm -hmm. the machine has been protected beyond what's in the normal policy as well, because that's part of our back out plan is to have a, a specifically timed protection point that we can use for our roll, rollback. Exactly. But that doesn't then drive the replication and archive, because that's not changing my, my standard data governance. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to have to explicitly say I want to uh, do an archive out to GCP. Right. So what this will do is it'll, it'll do an incremental again on the local, so it gets the latest copy, and then it does a uh, archive uh, to cloud. So if I have a look at this run, uh, we've got the local backup task going on at the moment. And that'll have to do a scan for changes, so that'll be a non-zero time. Yeah. And then we'll see this cloud archive task populate out as well. And, and here is where a couple of uh, scenarios that I've run in with customers and the questions they ask is, you know, if I have like 100 objects that I'm backing up, um, you know, uh, does, it, does the archive happen when all the uh, objects are backed up and then does an archive or does it actually do on an object to object level? Mm -hmm. um, and the answer to that is if you have 100 VMs that are locally backing up, as soon as the one copy of that VM gets done, it'll start doing a cloud archive. So allows us to be, you know, apart from having like an inherent parallel architecture, allows us to basically send data when we're to the cloud when we're ready as well. So we don't have to complete each phase of backup mm -hmm. archive um, separately. Exactly. All right. Well, this is going to take some time to complete as well. So we've had the protection run, the, the manual backup is, has run, uh, and that took. Uh, one minute and 34 seconds to, to run the actual backup task. And our cloud archive task has begun. It is, it is sending data across to, um, to Google now. And uh, we're getting data being uploaded. Uh, but it looks like it's going to take a fair while to complete that upload because uh, we are contending now for the bandwidth out of the lab with the live stream, and uh, hopefully the live stream is winning. <laughs> but it does mean that the uh, the upload time is looking like a while. It'd be interesting to see if it does actually take four hours, um, or whether it's one of those forecast time doesn't necessarily match up. But we have that progress going on. At the same time that we, uh, are we in admin, our upgrade process is still progressing. Uh, I guess actually the, the cluster view in here was uh, one that let us see the nodes and what version they were currently on. Yep, so we're everything's showing 6.2.2. Uh, yep, we're done. Yeah. So uh, does the upgrade cluster show us that as well? Mm -hmm. Just see if it's showing. Yeah, so it says that uh, current version is 6.2. We're, we're at the point we wanted to. What was the next thing we we're going to have a play with? Uh, uh, maybe it might be time to take a look at our uh, SaaS-based uh, platform called Helios. Excellent. That sounds like a good thing to have a look at. So if I remember from last time I was playing with Helios, it's here at helios.kaesity.com. And 
launch, uh, since I'm already logged into the support side, or I've already logged into Helios today, I can't quite work out how the, the uh, co-authentication works. Here it is. So if you've watched my videos where I've been using the Cohesity platform and, and basically showing you walkthroughs of my process, so on my uh, demitas.co.nz blog, uh, I've been doing writing about using the Helios products for a while. And you'll have seen this environment. So this has my two clusters, the, the uh, CoLab cluster, which is actually a virtual edition running on this in-the-room vSphere environment, as well as the CoCluster cluster, which is back home in New Zealand on my home lab. But now we need to uh, turn on this new cluster that we've just built, the BDL cluster. Where do I go? All right, so uh, in essence, you want to um, go to your um, to your cluster that we've just built. And we want to basically enable Helios on this. It's a bit of a refresh in here because yeah. we haven't got the Helios icon showing. Yeah, Log so in again. This, is, uh, this is a post upgrade, right? So it's just restarted the services. Agree to the license agreement for 6.2. <laughs> yeah, there we go. There we go. All right. Uh, so you, sh you should now, this is the latest version. You should see that H icon at the top right corner. You want to click on that and you want to enable Helios, right? And uh, click on, uh, just uh, toggle the button to enable. And that should just be it. Should then authenticate with. The, the cluster. If I wasn't currently connected to Helios or support side, it will actually pop authentication for me. That's what I saw when I was doing this yeah, that uh, is in my lab environment. And then that connecting to Helios, from what I recall, is there's a, a data transfer process that's going on at this point. And so some data starts to fill out in, in yeah. Helios. And uh, typically, it's, the, uh, it's a 443 port that it communicates through to get this part um, right. added. So it's very firewall friendly yep. so, for the perimeter. So if I come in here, yeah. my old clusters, it already shows build day live, BDL. Hasn't yet populated out all of the yep. information. We, we typically uh, give it about, with all the data at least that needs to come in, we'll, we'll give our a few hours until the data gets populated. All right. So um, just a precursor to Helios itself, right? So one of the problems that we wanted to solve like uh, three years back was to uh, you know, uh, get customers to start consolidating these different silos, right? Uh, so there was a lot of fragment, there is still, but to a large extent, you know, that's, we're at a point where you know, app, app management and global data management is the, is the way to go for a lot of businesses. So uh, the first thing you want to do is take your 60% of your infrastructure and put that under a single pane of glass. And, and that's what Coecity is there to solve from that standpoint. But once we are there, suddenly you know, uh, things become very interesting because uh, you know, for the first time you have the data from a single pane of glass. So suddenly the actionability of the data and what you can do with the data kind of exponentially increases. And that's where kind of Helio comes, Helios comes in uh, around a multi-cluster management, uh, around um, you know, smart predictable analytics that you can get out of it, but also run apps where most of your data is, because that's where, uh, that's where you'll get the value. So uh, I really like um Helios for giving me the ability to see a unified view across all of my Cohesity clusters uh, wherever they are. So I can come in and uh, take a look at my CO cluster back in New Zealand, remote cluster. Hmm. <laughs> I can certainly see historic information about it, but uh, right, right now Helios is, is showing us a few areas. I wonder if it will happily talk to my CoLab cluster, which is here. I was happy with CoLab. Uh, it's entirely possible there's an internet connection problem at, at my home uh, that's, that's driving that issue with seeing the code cluster. Uh, and yeah, build their lives still showing, showing behind. So apps, um, what do we need to do for our apps? Uh, so basically we wanna uh, go into our uh, Cohesity cluster that we have built and we wanna enable applications. You know, we might have to wait a little while because it's not letting me see through here. It's not letting me see the build day live cluster. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now that we've got quite a bit of time, uh, the slow internet connection or congested internet connection here seems to have, have synchronized down, and so we can 
pop in and we can see our build day live cluster is now populated up here in, in the uh, Helios portal. Uh, as we were watching for it to happen, one of the things we did to look at quite a lot was coming in here in the platform and clusters view to see the status of the clusters that are connected. And that's a nice different summary that shows us the, uh, the versions that we have out there and capacity and that kind of information. Yeah, and, uh, and, that, and that's, you know, I guess we live in a world where, you know, businesses are no longer, you know, local. It's, it's kind of a global infrastructure. So having that single pane of glass that gives you insight into all of your different clusters all across the world, uh, just from an infrastructure standpoint, and just barely on what version of code they're running and stuff like that, uh, that's the sort of single pane of glass, multi-cluster manager, that, uh, multi-cluster management that we bring in. And I could, for instance, come in and, and connect to my lab cluster in here, and I could run the upgrade out of Helios on that. Won't do that right now. It's mm -hmm. a, a single node virtual edition, and it'll uh, go out of service while that upgrade occurs. Yeah. But the thing we were talking about before was getting the applications running on the Cohesity cluster, actually running, bring the applications to to the data. Uh, so how am I going to turn that all on? All right. So uh, what we're going to do is we need to first, from a privacy, from a security standpoint, enable that from that cluster itself. So we want to connect to the the BDL cluster that we have built. Uh, all clusters doesn't have a platform view. <laughs> Uh, let's go back to BDL. All right, and uh, we want to go to the cluster settings, and we want to enable uh, enable applications. So if you just scroll down a little bit, uh, oh, we'll, oh, yeah. we'll, we'll we're, need we're in Helios. It. Yeah, we're in Helios. So we need to do that from our uh, back to the cluster itself, the cluster connectivity, right? Yeah, we go to cluster settings, and then we scroll down, and you see that toggle button that says enable app management. Yes, we do that. And so this is an internal subnet that's used by the apps. What's, yes, what's it's our natting uh, network inside of our system that we need to basically set. So a fairly large network, but it's not externally routable. Uh, it's it's entirely inside the Cohesity cluster. Probably shouldn't should be something that's reserved out of your IP address schema, so you don't end up with routing issues uh, across it. Exactly. And uh, yeah, oh. this is just a UI. So you, yeah, just put in your email address there. Not my actual email address. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sweet. Yeah. So. Now, uh, if we actually go back to our Helios console, uh, we can basically go to um, uh, go to app, go to apps now, and um, probably want to just refresh. I think I need the to be screen. at all clusters level. Don't, there we go. I needed to be at all clusters level to see apps. All right. So, um, what apps would you like to see, Alistair? All the apps, all of the time, please. <laughs> <laughs> the one that we certainly see most, the, the most talk about is Splunk. Yeah. Uh, is, so that's the ability to then look and, and run some analytics across the data that we have sitting on our KEC data platform. It kind of seems like the most natural synergy is that Splunk says we can make sense of whatever data you send us. Exactly. And, and here we have all of our data. Yeah. So we are that consolidated platform, and 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 the fit is pretty straightforward, right? You want to, you want to basically run Splunk as a, a small container on us, basically. So this allows us to, uh, you know, get into this app management piece now. So you can actually come come to apps, and you can just say install application. So we'll install app Splunk, and we'll you can actually the choose the cluster on where BDL you want to install. cluster because that's the only one that's up to sufficiently up to date. My other two clusters are running an older version. Mm -hmm. And so don't support this. And so the app will be installed on the cluster. Can we watch that anywhere else? Um, so you should be able to um, actually see that on the cluster itself. So if we come back onto the cluster, oh, it says it's ready to run the app. <laughs> so on the cluster summary, if I pop into the apps on the cluster. Mm -hmm. So you basically see. get a, a version that's installed. And what you want to do is create an instance of the Splunk next. So you can do that at the cluster level. Um, 
Oh, it just so it's it's that in down. install app option here is the same as up here in KZ to run the app. Yeah. Or oh, install to cluster. cluster. Let's push it to the cluster from here. From uh, no, I can't. I have already installed it to the one cluster, so I now need to come down onto the cluster. Oh, you can actually uh, run, you can actually run the app um, from the uh, from the uh, Helios UI itself. Correct. Right. And away it goes installing. Uh, now, if I remember correctly, this is where it's going to grab the entire Splunk. And this, these, these apps are running as containers with, um, you don't need to know this to use it, but the underlying infrastructure is containers and Kubernetes. And so yep. there's a bit of image download at this stage, which is also going to take a little while. So, well, while I was talking with Mike yesterday, uh, at least, while well, you were watching me talk with Mike yesterday, the install of the Splunk application onto the the cluster has completed. So, what's my next task? For us? So, um, in a, so one of the things that Goisi does is we can basically uh, expose our data stores, what we call as views, as NFS, SMB, or S3. So, uh, we need to basically let the Splunk run on a view. So, we need to create a view first. So, uh, let's go ahead and do that first mm -hmm. before we actually run the Splunk app on that. So you, you go to uh, platform. Views. Play views, yeah. And we want to create a view. Uh, first, they will give it a view name. Call this the Splunk data. Oh, look, I've called it Splunk data before. <laughs> On our default storage domain. So this sits alongside Along all of the other storage in that storage domain. Yeah, at least we recommend that you do. And and these are, these are some of the options that you get. You can actually expose this simultaneously as an NFS and an SMB uh, target for data, for, for, for a mount point for the data ingest to happen, right? So uh, you can choose how you want your view to be. Uh, we'll allow everything. <laughs> all right. Um, and then security, obviously. So we can actually, there is a overriding global whitelist that we'll set that will determine uh, which clients can connect to this particular view, right? So we can do that at the, uh, we, 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 we will need like an uh, umbrella setting on that. And then you can kind of set up some more granular access control from here. Okay. So I'll just turn that on, mm -hmm. create that view. All right. So um, that's about it. So what we want to also do is just set up a global whitelist so mm -hmm. that your, um, if we're I, I'm not necessarily required for here, but we set that up just to make sure that the uh, any clients accessing it has access to it. So what this looks like, it's here, mm -hmm. and I can add a add a subnet mask. So I'm going to add my lab network one nine two one six eight one ninety nine dot zero. Subnet mask is two five five. Two five five two five. I got an extra five, five in there. Uh, the uh, first yeah. Bit. Yeah. This is why we like CIDR ranges, where I just put a slash twenty four in, and I add that. Mm -hmm. And now we should be able to basically go to our apps and run the Splunk app. On. How about if I take a look and see if I can see this share? Oh, sweet. Uh, two one six eight dot. 62 is one of our, yeah, there there's go. my Splunk data share. So, so uh, this one, uh, customers kind of like that, uh, uh, like this flexibility of this feature. And apart from yeah. having a slew of data protection features, we can also expose this as a share. So I'm just going to grab some files that I created earlier, copy those, paste them into this view. And so it's just a file share that I can put files into now. Mm -hmm. Cool. And then it's as simple as going to the apps, and uh, we can actually create create an instance out of that Splunk by saying run app. And then you basically get, um, a, you know, if you actually go the the QS policy, we don't really need to mm -hmm. change. But basically, if you go down to read permissions, you can say specified views, and there you go, your Splunk data views here. So it's not going to be given. Carte blanche global access to all of my data. It's it's exactly. this particular set of data yeah. you have, and it's read only access in there as well. So mm -hmm. it's not going to be able to modify anything. There we go. It's good. So we can add a description as we like, and um, <laughs> and then you can just say run app. 
so uh, yeah sometimes uh, you know i think it, you know two clicks kind of went in when you click that so okay it always happened. so if we then come back into apps we should see that there's maybe a running instance uh, go to all instances uh okay no it hasn't seen that run maybe i was just holding my mouth wrong while i was doing it <laughs> we'll try that again specified views allow splunk data uh, and I'm not going to add a description this time and see. Mm -hmm. That time was happier. Right. That's the fun things that we're doing live. <laughs> if you oh, like live demos right. are the most terrifying thing you can possibly <laughs> do. Um, <laughs> no matter how many times you practice it, something doesn't necessarily go exactly as it did last time you practiced. Yep. So it is running. I mean, you get a, you get a warning saying some components might not fully be up, so it's probably doing some kind it's of a restart still, of service. Still, still doing startups. Yeah. So. Um, that should kind of clear out pretty soon. There we, there go. we go. And, and then you can open up. Open it, and it. Uh, it's not ready yet. Still. Yeah. We'll we'll leave that for a moment to longer to see uh, how it's going. Let's pop back into the main Cohesity cluster and uh, the main Helios cluster and just make sure everything's reasonably happy in our environments. I'm just noticing I've got a critical error showing up in here, so I'm a little interested in what's going on with critical. Mm -hmm. uh, so my cluster at home has, has a critical error. So if I make a quick look and see if we can talk to him successfully now. Uh, it doesn't want to talk to my cluster at home. The critical error may be that my cluster is offline. That's your <laughs> cluster in uh, New Zealand? Yes, that's the one in New Zealand. Oh, okay. Uh, it's, we've been away for a week now, so uh, <laughs> it may, may not be happy. Let's take another look and see. Oh, Splunk. There we go, yeah. Do I remember what that password was? Yeah, it's, it's a, uh, I can type it in yeah, for you if you want. Yeah, you can go ahead and type I have in better muscle memory on this one. There we go. And so now I've got, yeah, let's, let's not save that password. Um, so now I've got Splunk running on my Cohesity cluster. I've not needed to deploy any additional infrastructure beyond Cohesity in order to get Splunk Analytics. Yep. Well, that was easy. That seems pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we've, what have we done so far? We've deployed a cluster from scratch. We've configured it to protect uh, a bunch of virtual machines by tags and by folders and by specifically selecting virtual machines. We've added archiving out to object storage, in this case on Google, but that's not the only platform that's supported for object storage. Uh, we've attached to, oh, we've done an upgrade. We've done a, a, an upgrade from the current long-term support to a, a feature release. That feature release was what was required before we could do apps. Correct. Uh, and then we've done those apps. Wow, that's a... Quite a bit of things That's done quite a lot of things in, in a couple of hours. Yeah. Uh, I guess, though, that I don't really think the protecting data is, is the end for us, though. <laughs> yeah, we want to be able to recover it. So let's uh, leave this copy of Splunk alone, and uh, let's uh, accidentally delete some things. So that data folder that I just copied things around, that's that's got some files in it, so I'm just going to accidentally delete some manuals out of here that I might maybe want to get back again. Um, and, and remember, I guess this, this virtual machine is being protected, right? Yes. Correct, yeah. Yes, this virtual machine is, is specifically being protected, so if we pop into the um, protection jobs, we have this virtual machine is called DC, and we have a job for DC, mm -hmm. and we did that successful uh, backup and it hasn't yet run a scheduled archive to GCP. Actually, yep. let's take a look if that archive to GCP that we ran manually has completed, or whether it still says it's going to take four hours. Yeah, it's still contending for still some uh, shares bandwidth, on the bandwidth limit bandwidth, somewhere. Yeah. Okay, but we have local protection for it. Mm -hmm. So I now need to get those files back. I think I was a little silly having deleted some vitally important manuals <laughs> out of the, the folder. Right, so uh, the way we look at recovery 
uh, with Coicity and, 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 and the beauty of what Mohit and an engineers have built is giving customers different granularities of options for recovery, right? So that could be as, you know, it could be your decision making CEO saying, I want that PDF right now, send it to me an email when things have gone down. So it, you need to be able to kind of be tactical in that way, but also give you the larger granularity of, you know, bringing Thirty virtual machines back online instantly. So uh, our goal with Coicity is to having the latitude for you to achieve both these targets. So let's maybe start from something small and then start to go with bigger data sets for okay. uh, for the viewing audience. Shall we recover those two two files that I just deleted by accident? Why don't we just search for it? Okay. So you do recover files and folders, and. Uh, I think Sennheiser uh, was the n There it is. There it is. There's a file that I want to bring back. Uh, you know, we've only got one recovery point in here because we've only done done one. The second one is still in progress since still in pro the, right. it's going the archive okay. targets. So I have to wait for the entire protection run to complete before I can yep. recover. But uh, yeah. ideally, if you were to uh, have this in the local and archive and your replicated sites, then it would indicate that this particular snapshot taken at this particular time would be available across the targets. So we just those have icons. targets being local. Exactly. Okay. So this gives you the option that you wanted to, uh, you know, recover in. And uh, for single files, usually you want to download and, you know, probably send that as a email. You know, email. I actually want this one. I want to recover in place. Let's do that. So we'll recover the server on that one. Mm -hmm. And it says there's a recovery task. This is what I'm recovering from this particular time, and I could choose a different time here. Uh, I need to connect to the domain controller. Okay, uh, that is administrator, and the password is that one. Recover to original overwrite. Let's not overwrite any existing file mm -hmm. because, well, we don't want to, and just recover files. Yep. That looks pretty simple. Yeah, so it should basically, so again, this is the power of Coecity of the ability to do NFS SMB S3 out of, uh, out of our storage box, right? So you should see that mount point come up on your box with that file being recovered pretty soon. So will I see a mount point up for this? Because I said recovery. Actually, actually place. We'll go it'll go to the your, other direction. Yeah, it just goes to wherever it came from. It'll basically. be connecting to the admin C dollar share and, and putting data back, presumably. Uh, go to recovery. How are we doing? 15% complete. So let's watch that fault. There's my there file come back. And now I can open up the manuals for the wireless uh, microphones that I've got in my hand. So that looks good. Nice. <laughs> but I might also want to recover a, a single file in a different mechanism. So I also had a Super, there we go, the manual for my servers in the lab that I want to restore. So this time I'll, I'll go for a, a, a download. Yeah, so this is typically where Ooh. you want to download and send that as an email to that, someone files, asking for it. files immediately here in my downloaded items and the manual for, that was frighteningly fast. So I immediately have now in, in my downloaded items that file. It's, Straight, I'm amazed how fast that is. I haven't actually done that that download recovery before. That's very cool. If you've got an executive who is leaning on your shoulder and saying, "I need need that report, not the version that I that I saved last night because I was um, doing something silly. I, I need yesterday's version." Uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, that flexibility is is kind of appreciated from the folks of, who are using us in this uh, in this scheme. What's my next scale of granularity? Let's actually go. Let's go up the order now. Let's say you want to do a single virtual machine restore. Okay. Um, well, let me log in and delete a virtual machine so we can restore mm -hmm. it over place. So I might have accidentally deleted a virtual machine. If you're hearing a little bit of noises, it seems like there's some deliveries uh, to the floor above us, and so there's a bit of rattling um, of, of equipment. So I'm going to take this uh, launcher 01 because it's top of the list, and I'm just going to power him off. And then I'm going to delete him from disk. 
kind of uh, aggressively remove things. Delete from disk. Yes. So now launcher one is, is all gone. And let's see if I can bring back launcher 01. Ref cover VM. Mm -hmm. And search for your asset. So launcher mm -hmm. zero 01. There he is in the list. I will continue on with him. I'm not going to rename him, I'm going to bring him back to his original location. I'm going to keep the networking and start connected because it's replacing the existing. Yeah, and you want to probably turn, turn the power Turn off, option. powered off. That's an interesting semantic choice. Um, right, let's go do it. Finish. All right. Task is running. And I guess I'm going to see progress in here, but I'm also interested in the progress at the v vSphere. Layer. You might actually see the VM already present now. Or oh, this VM here. Mm -hmm. It's back. <laughs> so he's already back. Already so, powering on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And if I show all tasks rather than just the running tasks, and I'll make this a little larger so we can see the tasks. Uh, we've got our power on completed. Uh, that's the one that I wanted to, us to see was the create NAS data store task. Right, so how that recovery process works is as soon as you click that recover button, we basically did an instantaneous mount of an FS data store onto that ESX host. And then we basically registered that machine coming from Cohesity, right? And then once we powered it on, it's already usable. So while the power, while the, while the user is using the machine, we can basically at the back do a storage v motion to where it came from from a primary storage standpoint. Right. So there's this um, Cohesity int 42. I didn't clean up a couple of mm -hmm. uh, data stores from from earlier restores. I should really clean those up. So uh, yeah, so that's that's something that I definitely show in my demo. That is a <laughs> virtual machine recovery. Yeah, and so we have this machine is now uh, launch a console on it. We'll see a, a running Windows instance in a moment as soon as the console connects. Yeah, so mm -hmm. we can we can see that we can log onto this launcher machine now. It's connected. Yeah, straight away available. Has that task to migrate finished? If I just switch to running tasks. So the Someone migrate is still in progress. It's mm -hmm. still in, in the flight between the Cohesity data store and the uh, vSAN data store. Yep. Nice. So that's that's a single machine recovery, and it's going to take about another minute or so to, to complete that recovery. Cool. All, uh, well, the next step is to go bigger, right? Go big or go home. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that again. So, all of this is part of our platform goodness that our engineers have built. Uh, and this is again one of uh, the value propositions of Cohe Cities where we do really well is in instant mass restores. So, I'm going to take this bunch of virtual machines here. Wow, Alistair, you're a brave man. <laughs> uh, it's only some Windows machines. They're, they're, they're backed up. They're protected. <laughs> Power the whole lot off. And delete all 10 virtual machines from disk. Yeah. Cool, they're all gone. That's freed up some space. I'm not sure if I want them back. <laughs> Is there any uh, way to protect it so if somebody does delete it that uh, that it will say, hey, you know, this is this is meant to stay around? So at the vSphere layer, we would use security permissions to make sure that it was an authorized person doing the delete. Yep. Uh, that's definitely a vSphere issue rather than a cohesity issue to, to protect you. And uh, good security design would be very important there. But we do have from from a looking at it from like a corollary of it is we do have like self self access portal capabilities for users having the ability to access the data that they're supposed to recover from and then we have integrations with things like ServiceNow so you can basically send an approval ticket saying you know what this user requested the recovery of this VM so that if it goes through some kind of a management change for that approval workflow to happen so um, and we can kind of tie this up uh, to an automation or tie it up with an integration to a, to a tool like ServiceNow Okay. Now I've 
deleted all of those Windows machines. <laughs> I had better restore some uh, files again. Yeah. Uh, and this time I'm just going to search by gold because that was everything that was in my gold uh, folder based protection. Yeah. And so I just select the entire uh, protection job. Yep. And that's cool. Yeah, this is, uh, and from, you know, if you just kind of look underneath the covers, this is how, this is the goodness of our, our snap tree. And this is our, and this is the, the secret sauce of Cohesity in terms of how good we are in terms of how we store these snapshots in our advanced B plus tree mechanism, as well as the ability to take, uh, to do these hydrated restores and do it parallelly because we are a distributed architecture. So mm -hmm. all of this sort of, um, in, in a lot of the other uh, legacy systems, there's some amount of centralization in the architecture. So the bottlenecks uh, of doing like a mass restore of 30 virtual machines is caught up at a, dif at a different point in your network schema. For us, the fact that we're distributed, the fact that we can, uh, you know, we have an efficient way we store our uh, metadata, uh, and the fact that it's hydrated, we can basically bring this up instantly. So hopefully this let's, is... Let's see how, how instantly how we, we actually it. get usable <laughs> machines. So again, I'm going to uh, keep the name. I could come in here and choose to rename adding a, mm -hmm. a prefix to the virtual machine name. Uh, if I wasn't recovering from an actual failure, if I wanted a, a copy deployed somewhere, yep. uh, that's that kind of function that I'd use. Uh, still network attached. We're going to power these machines on and get them back as soon as possible. And I could choose... Uh, what recovery point to bring them back from as well, although again, yeah, that'll, I only have one here. it will give you a time-wise snapshot that you want to choose yeah. from. Yeah. So we can finish that out and there it goes running again. What does vSphere see at this point? Well, we've got machines going on. Um, so vSphere is seeing at least the first machine registered. Mm -hmm. And yeah, more machines being registered as we go. So that's progressing along. And virtual machine startup has begun. And the main thing that's being slow in this is probably, in fact, my console being able to see uh, these these changes, these updates occurring. So if I refresh the view in here, we'll probably see even more has has progressed. So yeah, that's the beauty of uh, yeah. It's we call this IMR instant mass restore around here. So and I'll pop up a console on this machine, and at the moment. Uh, this particular virtual machine is is stored mostly on the Cohesity cluster, and it's in in flight back to the vSAN cluster. And what we'll see is the restore time on this is limited by the fact that I have a two-node vSAN cluster that is being fed by a four-node Cohesity cluster. And there's, there's a bit of a mismatch that, yep. that my uh, little cluster is going to be the limiting factor in here. But we should shortly see uh, an operating system uh, a login prompt in here. There we go. There we go. There's a login prompt, and pretty quickly, while it's still in flight, I can hit the login button. And of course, Windows is lying when it says it's ready to log in, but not too long after, I can log in with my domain credentials because it's on the network. And uh, we should see a, a Windows desktop fairly shortly. So the, the key point for me in that is that I don't have to wait for the storage relocation to get access to the applications running in the virtual machine. Correct. They're immediately accessible to me. And presumably we're using quite a lot of the, um, or we, if there's writes going on, they're going to the solid state in, in the um, Cohesity appliance. So we're not being limited by the um, spinning disk, which is good for throughput, but not necessarily good for transactions. Yeah, that's correct, yeah. Um, and there we go, we've got a, a Windows desktop up at about the same speed as the Windows desktop normally comes up inside these virtual machines. So that absolutely usable um, while it's in, in flight and the recoveries are underway, but looks like they're gonna take yeah, so the some minutes. The extent, I mean, the the status is not just the power on, but the status is recover to your primary data store as well. So, right. so the recovery task, out. because that storage relocation happened immediately, and um, I didn't have to do anything else to move the running VMs. That was all all part of the recovery. Well, our instant mass restore has has been instantly service uh, returned, but it's still going to be a little while before the virtual machines come up. Mm -hmm. So how about we protect some other kind of data? 
I did here in the early part of the call that's uh, around Office 365. Maybe you can take a look at that. Sure. Right. Oh my God. So uh, one of the things that, you know, the, the whole setup and configuration piece of something like Office 365 is fairly simple with CoECD. So um, we basically, uh, you know, while we won't waste time showing you some of the exchange options. In essence, you have about five permissions that you need to enable on a Cohesity account there. Uh, and all you need to do, like how we did, like adding a source, uh, adding a VMware source and adding some of the other external target as a source, go to sources and we'll basically register an Office 365 admin account. And that's all you need to do to basically get your integration done. So do you, oh, you already as do. It happens. <laughs> I do have a uh, Office 365 account that I can manage. Uh, I just have to remember my password. Yep. And the Let's idea, see if I got the, it right. and the idea is simplicity of integration here. So uh, yeah, there we go. Your Office 365 is registered. So it typically takes me, and I and I actually time the time the time the whole operation process of going to Exchange, adding some of these permissions, then coming to Cohesity and adding the account, and it's very, very easy. So if you need some reference on, on adding those permissions, uh, Chris Colotti wrote, wrote up that process on the Cohesity blog um, early this year, I think it was. Mm -hmm. uh, or I've done a video on that as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> you've got a blog too on this one, right? <laughs> Right, so uh, by now you should be fairly, you know, uh, aware of the process, right? It's, it's, you know, we have the policy. All we need to do is create a protection job for your Office 365 account, right? So protect Office 365. 365. Uh, we'll give it in. We'll give it a name. Uh, Outlook. Why not? Mm -hmm. uh, and choose, uh, choose your box. And here's where you basically get, you know, this is your admin account, so you basically get all the uh, associated email accounts with it. I'm going to protect all of our Outlook environment. I'm going to auto protect mm -hmm. if, if Demitas, um, my personal company, gets really huge and I have to, to employ 15 more people, I'd like those, those protected as well. Right. And then add. And again, you know, uh, the idea of that one-time set policy is you, do you want to reuse that policy? Do you want this data to basically be, or do you want the data to be long-time archived to uh, a cloud object store as well? So you have the ability to sort of switch on that. So it's all very much the same settings that we have on any of the other protection jobs. Yep. It's just that it's a different source type. And then it's protect. Yeah, that's it. So... Awesome. This should um, this should start once again. The the, the job will will start up as soon as the schedule engine inside the KCD platform sees that it's not compliant with the policy. And again, uh, so right now it, it'll basically be pulling out the first copy of that uh, mailboxes and stuff via internet. So we'll see how long it takes. I I imagine that also mm -hmm. will take some time. There we go. It has begun. And it is it is running in parallel the backups of the t the two mailboxes mine and, and Tracy's. And I guess one of the points that I want to sort of bring to bring to picture is uh, we do a lot of parallel ingests. Now we we dealt with VMware workloads. We dealt with uh, you know like Office three sixty five now, but. This parallel architecture applies to your SQL workloads and Oracle workloads as well. Uh, the way we work is at the point of time of ingest, all of the data gets uh, basically sprayed across all of the nodes. Um, and uh, we actually have our underlying file system is strictly consistent, so we make sure that we have a solid copy of the data in our hard drive before we basically acknowledge that data has been written or not. And that comes up in scenarios during failures. Yes. Yeah. If you have a node failure in the middle of a backup, mm -hmm. you need to be absolutely certain that your your data has been written to multiple locations. It's not good enough to be in cache. It needs to be out in persistent locations on multiple yeah. nodes. And, and that's a very important criteria for uh, for for the resiliency of the platform. And we score really well in it. And I almost welcome this as a part of like a POC test plan, where you know when a backup is happening, I would go at the back, pull out a node. And in a lot of other scenarios, uh, what happens is the SLA gets reset. So if you're doing like eight, you know, or 16 terabyte backup of a VM or, or a large mailbox, and suddenly you basically have, 
you know, it's either the job fails because of a node failure or the whole SLA goes back to zero and you're backing up the entire thing. Right. And that's the problem with some of the eventual consistent models, right? For us, it, at worst, you will lose that, uh, you know, 200 megabytes to 250 megabytes per second that that one node is giving the, the you. Yeah. But you're, you're still trudging your way towards your SLA without sweating about it. Right. Nicely. So in progress on our cluster at the moment, we have protection run going on. We also have uh, uh, mass recovery going on. Uh, that's successfully completed migration of four of the virtual machines back onto the vSAN data store. So there's only six still in transit. So mm -hmm. we're getting, getting along and definitely seeing this theme of concurrent actions uh, going on along here. And our mass recovery is continuing to, to run. So it's, uh, how have we gone on that mass recovery now? Uh, still only showing the four, four complete. Um, let's take a look at the protection job for Office 365 as well, see if that's, that's finished out. It hasn't, and uh, my gold policy, <laughs> that is, is now protecting the machines that have come back again. Now we're doing, we have, we're doing a lot of stuff right well, now. Lots <laughs> going on in this cluster. Uh, hey, is there a, a resource manager that shows me the load on my cluster? Uh, you you can actually look at a monitoring and uh, you know performance, so that basically gives you the overall throughput uh, to uh, you know the latency and the IOPS and the CPU charts as well. So and so then we have advanced advanced diagnostics where you can kind of drill down to on a, a protection job level or a policy job to kind of figure out where uh, what is contributing to possible performance problems. That you so might all have. of this, as we can see, we're doing quite a lot. And e even though we've been doing a lot through this, we've still been sitting down at 15% CPU yeah. and memory utilization. We've uh, read and write latency is still, what have we got? We've got a spike of read latency up to uh, seven milliseconds, yeah. um, but mostly sub one millisecond. And, and doing a reasonable amount of, of transactions. And you know, that's primarily going to be limited by my lab, not by this. Yeah, I think your four node cluster we can uh, we can get up to you know gigabytes per second uh, quite easily. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. What other monitoring do we have in there? Uh, um, you you can basically check your deduplication storage reduction over time in terms of right. uh, and this is what customers would like to track as well, right? You know what I should do is take a look through Cohesity at my longer running mm -hmm. lab cluster and see what we see in there in terms of the the monitoring because that's been running for a few months although there's been a bit of uh, a bit of outage along the way but yeah fairly consistent stats in there and the uh, utilization of resources on my virtual edition shouldn't be particularly high yeah it hasn't been doing terribly much in the last 24 hours but maybe the last seven days will show us something with some gaps for travel <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah so there's there's good stats available in there Again, uh, coming back to Helios in order to see those stats across multiple machines. Yeah, so uh, the idea with that, right? So with Helios, it's it's it's, it's kind of a three-bucket thing, the multi-cluster management and having the ability for us to do predictive analytics on the data collected from all of these clusters, and we cover the app piece as well. So, um, sorry, you wanted to ask me a question? Yeah, I, I was going to point out that I have uh, in, in my mailbox that we've just protected, uh, was somewhere in here. Oh, it's not in that folder. It's actually in my inbox. Uh, there is actually a, a notification in here from Cohesity support mm -hmm. to say that my cluster is going to hit 90% utilization in 90 days. Uh, and that's a Helios alert because my cluster isn't actually set up uh, to, to send me alerts. Uh, yep. So there's the proactive notifications out of Helios uh, that came through quite literally this week since I've been here. Yeah, that's the beauty about that, right? Uh, and having the ability and not ju just data collection across different clusters. Where we're moving to in terms of uh, in terms of enterprise is, you know, how efficient are you with your data management, right? And uh, there's there's the ability to do basically machine learning models within the system, as well as crowdsourcing a lot of this data as well to kind of see if you are at your optimal utilization uh, of of your storage units. Some comparative benchmarking for industries. Exactly. Now this has been my lab environment that mm -hmm. we've been looking at, but you have access to much more extensive environment to, to show some larger scale things. Would you like to take over the driver's seat for oh, a little sure, bit yeah. and, and show us some of that? 
So, um, all right. So this go a little bit more closer. All right. So one of the things uh, with Coecity also is the uh, regardless of where you deploy it, uh, be it on premise, and uh, Alistair, you mentioned you have a virtual edition. Uh, or on you know in any of the commercial clouds this particular one I'm actually doing a uh, it's actually Chris's environment that I've borrowed but we all SEs use this for demos basically where we actually have an office 365 uh, backup and protection jobs running perpetually uh, if I were to use that until now uh, the functionality kind of is similar across on all of your commercial clouds so if you were to deploy a coincity on Azure AWS um, or GCP, the look and feel and the functionality is, a, is basically the same. And we, and that's that's a very important schema as well because, you know, you're not dealing with these hundred different technologies that you're kind of aggregating into under one uh, set system. It's just the same platform. Consistent types of policies and and consistent platform out. And incidentally, we have a uh, video from. Uh, Chris Colotti about using the Helios interface to deploy the virtual the virtual edition out onto uh, he deployed onto AWS. Mm -hmm. uh, we won't have time to get to that video today, but it will be published in the playlist on YouTube. So the V Brown Bag, find the Cohesity Build a Live at Cohesity playlist, and you'll find uh, Chris's video about deploying that. Uh, we also won't get to to uh, John Hildebrand's video about the uh, cloud spin, the ability to use that DevOps functionality that's in in the platform to spin up a temporary workload on some cloud provider and then have it torn down later. So that video also you'll be able to catch later. I'm sorry, I'm caught. <laughs> it stops you in the middle of the uh, the exposition here about this larger environment. Yeah, so I think I'll, I'll focus on um, I'll focus on Office three sixty five, right? Um, I think we covered the protection piece of it mm -hmm. and how it is to add it. Uh, you know, recovering mailboxes is uh, you know let's see what Coistri brings to the table over there, right? So uh, again, you know, the workflow stays the same. So from an operational standpoint, you know, the training is minimal. Uh, I go to recovery. And like you basically did recovery of files, we did recovery of virtual machines. You could do that for uh, SQL and Oracle databases or just an instant volume mount out of our storage system. You know, I can actually go and recover Office 365 mailboxes as well. Uh, and here, again, you know, uh, we have that global search on top because we index everything underneath. I can search for a particular mailbox. Say, do I have mine over here? Uh, probably not. But uh, let's actually do Chris's mailbox recovery, right? So uh, I can choose him. And again, you know, here's the same kind of a workflow where if, in case I'm interested in, you know, recovering uh, data from a previous set of snapshots, uh, I can basically come over here and this gives me the entire um, catalog of all the different snapshots and data protection that I've done. And that could be really important if we've got long-term archive and we're doing an e-discovery activity and we need to get access to a mailbox condition at a particular point in time to establish when communication came through. Right. Those multiple points in time become very important. Right. And and also, uh, while we one of the things that we enable is this whole data mobility piece as well, right? So we're doing uh, one of the pieces we did not cover fully, but we probably did in some of the videos is around you know how we can do point to point replication for DR uh, and uh, our ability to kind of you know cross connect different cloud networks as well. There's some sort of agnosticness that that we bring to the table, or, you know, regardless of whether your data is running on on-premise or cloud, we treat it the same way. So you can basically, from your recovery point, can be, you know, the cloud if you're, if that's where your client is requesting the data from, or it could be on-premise. So we allow us to basically choose that particular snapshot and also decide where it needs to basically come from. Um, and then, you know, it's as simple as, you know, you can also, and, and speaking specifically from an Office 365 standpoint, I could recover this to my original mailbox as well, or I could basically recover to an alternate location if I need be. So, um, so it might be a staff member who's left the organization and you need to get their mailbox accessible to mm -hmm. another user. Exactly. So um, I'll keep that off here. And, um, and that's it, you know, I can start recovery. And what happens is, if I actually go to my, uh, I actually have a login of my restores. Pretty soon, what will happen is I'll basically get a, 
another folder over here that says recover the recovers that stack to this particular uh, recovery process that I ran that will bring in all of Chris's emails over here. So and that, I really like the both the ease of doing that search. So I did individual item level restores with um, Office 365 and it was easy to find specific messages or a folder containing messages. And then I was amazed by just how fast that data came back when I was doing individual messages. Awesome, yeah. yeah. Um, so this is gonna take quite a bit because Chris, uh, Chris has got a large mailbox. A large mailbox. <laughs> um, but uh, what do we wanna see next, Alistair? Well, some, some things around the large, larger scale because these labs are somewhat larger than you can take on a plane with mm -hmm. you. Uh, what do we see if we've got lots of clusters and lots of protection jobs, lots of things going on in the environment? So let's take a look at this particular lab over here. So if I actually look at uh, sources, I'm doing quite a bit over here. Uh, um, I have a VMware source that I'm protecting. Uh, I, can, I also have the ability to add uh, AWS, GCP, Azure, or Hyper-V as a source as well. So that uh, speaks to our breadth of uh, the different functionalities that we can actually accommodate. And, and it's important to also point out that we do this at scale. Uh, so a lot of enterprises have adopted us because we're, you know, the, the stability and the resiliency really shows when you actually throw a kitchen sink at a solution. Um, and typically a lot of times, and, and we try to be as realistic as possible with POCs as well because they, it really shows our platform when you, when, you, when you actually throw a load on us and how we basically function in those uh, circumstances. Um, but it also gives us the ability to look at recover points, not just, you know, you might have, uh, you know, you might be protecting VMware workloads today, but uh, we have the ability, as Chris, as, as Alistair mentioned, that John's gonna talk about CloudSpin. Um, and it was looked at as a test dev workflow for a, la for a large amount of time, but it, sometimes some of the interesting information comes from the customers themselves, where they started using this as a cloud migration strategy. Because okay. the, the main main function there is we, we can basically take a, a hypervisor VM, and I'd say this with Hyper-V as well, and basically convert that into an AWS, Azure, or a, or a GCP workload, basically. So just giving us that platform agnosticness and giving, giving basically all these tactical as well as strategic ideas to customers to plan their migration has been one of uh, Coecity's strength uh, based on some of the feedback that I've received as well. And I, I guess there's a huge value proposition for these customers around the data efficient transfer. Uh -huh. that, that you don't have to have the system down for a bulk transfer of a, an entire virtual machine and the conversion into a virtual machine on the destination platform is automated. And there's a lot of value in, in simplifying those tasks. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's the platform goodness that, uh, that comes with it. Because every time when we do a backup, when we do these archive tasks, it's it's using our globally duplicated data, and uh, every time there's a transfer between two Cohesity environments, regardless of the size, regardless of the type, we're only doing a metadata handshake between those two uh, systems. So, um, so let's take a look at our uh, virtual virtual uh, environment over here. Um, I'm going to switch over to the vSphere environment. So this is uh, this is our larger uh, cluster, as uh, Alistair mentioned. Um, you know, we have a ton of stuff over here that we're basically protecting. And uh, if I basically go to the dashboard, you know, I get a sense of what the storage reduction looks like as well. Does that look like it? Are you able to show me the global level across all clusters for the? Uh Data reduction, since you know, the the broader you look at these these numbers, yep. um, the more likely they are to be applicable to customers. So we're still seeing double figure um, storage reduction. Yeah, um, and 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 this progressively gets better as we as we add more data, as we add more heterogeneous data. Because yeah. uh, people talk about deduplication, and it's been around for a while. 
but you know, a few of a few of us in the market actually do what we call the global variable and deduplication, and and a part of that is you know having the ability to basically fingerprint different kinds of data and being optimal for that data, but at, but basically bringing the data under one uh, one namespace, basically. So having a consistent way of dealing with variable data, mm -hmm. and data yeah. types, and that. Which is why, uh, which is why we, you know, the more heterogeneous data you throw at us, while we have to be more uh, cautious in how we size that data, uh, the overall efficiency is actually higher, yeah. right? Yeah. So, so as you can see over here, um, this is the this is the global storage reduction. But I've basically split this up into th three clusters that I've seen over here. Obviously, Chris is doing some interesting things in GCP where he's seeing 400x, <laughs> you know, data reduction. Um, and uh, but yeah, just just this kind of you know single pane of glass view into just something as simple as how much data reduction I'm getting is something wasn't there. Looking at our build day live uh, cluster here, our uh, recovery has completed our instant mass recovery of those 10 machines has completed out and uh, where was our 35 minute duration of that probably 29 minutes was waiting for the storage emotions to complete. Yep. Uh, but we have all of those virtual machines now up and operational on our uh, vSphere cluster. So that recovery is completed out and it seems to have behaved really nicely. Uh, in the protection jobs we saw a begin of the protection of the gold policy and we've got a, a warning on it status it probably couldn't quite complete out this pass uh, but I'm sure it will, will run again and we can see that the Outlook um, protection is still running so it's a good thing you were able to demonstrate that with yep. Chris's uh, and finally the cloud replication cloud archive is still chugging along and going to take a little while Again, I don't think that's representative of what it's like in an enterprise scale network. It's uh, there's some restrictions on our production network here. Yeah, typically uh, the 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 first full that goes to the cloud uh, takes some time because it's the first hydration of that data there. Uh, everything that's subsequent is very fast. So you know we're looking at you know I have instances of you know multiple terabytes uh, with uh, with changes that happen and it can basically replicate every 15 minutes to an archive data without any problem um, but yeah the, the first one usually is the longest after which and you can, you can manage that a bit by progressively adding um, virtual machines or, or whatever the, the, it is that you're protecting into the protection um, job over time so you don't get this one massive <laughs> Uh, copy over time, so that's it's it's not uh, that's hard. To yeah, manage. we can we can stage that for sure. Uh, we did have have one query around um, backup products and life cycling. So if if I've got an existing um, enterprise backup product in play, uh, what does it look like as I start to adopt Cohesity? Is yeah. there ways to leverage Cohesity with existing products? So yeah. How does yeah. that how does yeah. that play? So uh, you know we have integrations with all the major vendors like the Isilons and the NetApps and stuff like that. Uh, so we, we can basically connect to it via, via an NAS adapter and, and basically start backing that up. Um, typically, and that's, that's where our value is not disruptive in the sense that you need to basically rip and replace everything. Um, once we basic, well, at least with my customers, once I get them to understand the value, uh, you know, we'll we'll solve the main pain point first. And the main pain point could be something like data protect, or it could be scale out NAS, uh, or it could be data migration. So uh, depending upon the breadth of the problem, we can we have. We, the, the same solution can apply to all. So we'll just connect to that particular storage system and start, you know, taking one pain point at a time. It could, and we'll start doing data protection to begin with, and start basically bringing the data on, under this global deduplication platform, and then uh, slowly, uh, you know, address all the different silos that are present, bring that under one platform, and pro and by the time we're, you know, we're uh, after we do the entry after a couple of points, the customers kind of get where we're going, and they sort of do this themselves and come back to me and say, hey, I just uh, migrated this uh, vSphere to Nutanix in two minutes. Thank you. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> you should have let me know. But yeah. I, I would have loved to have helped you with yeah. that. But <laughs> clearly, customers are finding it easy to use, as we heard from Dan, and, and liking that. That actually ability. is a tangible use case that happened last week to me. So. <laughs> Excellent. So I think we're drawing to a close. I think it's a good time to look back. So what have we done today? 
Perhaps? Right. So uh, quite a bit of things, right? So we started off by uh, you know installing the cluster from scratch. Uh, with all the equipment you have, you made this so easy, Alistair. <laughs> uh, yeah, we connected to the one node, uh, got all the four nodes online inside of uh, about five minutes. Uh, created a policy, we did protection of VMware jobs, uh, we did long-term archive, we did, um, what we do next? We did long-term archive and then we did uh, Helios as well. We uh, added our cluster to a global single pane of glass uh, SaaS platform that we offer. Um, we, we, we installed Splunk on it. We had to do a version upgrade before we could do install Splunk as well. That's the biggest thing I miss. Yeah, we yeah. did version upgrade prior to all of this. So while but we were backing up, mm -hmm. we did a, we did an upgrade of our software. Um, quite, I mean, this is literally my day at a you know at a customer doing POC or, or pilot implementation. Uh, we did that. Uh, we we saw the benefits of Helios. We saw Splunk running. Um, and then, and then we we did different granular restores as well. We did a gran restore of a file to your desktop that you can send via to an email. We did a restore of a couple of files that uh, through an SMB share that you could recover. Uh, we did a virtual machine recovery as well as uh, instant mass restore of uh, twenty odd VMs that you had. So, um, and then we looked took a look at Office three sixty five as well in terms of what Coicity brings to the table there. <laughs> a fairly comprehensive amount of uh, data protection and mobility covered in three hours and 20 minutes. Uh, we've already talked about some of the things we didn't get to because we were had so much content. So do watch for more content coming out over time. Uh, and particularly one of the, the other highlights was Jim Wilde, who was another customer talking to us about how he uh, rolled in a lot of cohesity to replace a legacy backup environment and uh, that's that's worth uh, a, a listen and, and a look. And we also didn't quite get to uh, Raj Duth, uh talking about how the ransomware protection uh, capabilities that we have with the Cohesity platform. So that's another great video that uh, you'll be able to catch as we release them out. Uh, so definitely stay tuned for more content. This has been a, a great fun week. We always spend a week with the, the customers that we're doing these Build Day Live events with. And we've spent this week here at the Coho City Head Offices in San Jose, uh, working with the uh, technical advocacy group. So uh, Chris and John and, and Mike and uh, Teresa, who unfortunately didn't get to be here with us this week. And then of course, we were the guests of the marketing department and so particular thanks to Lynn for, for having us here. Um, also with us doing social media, uh, Tracy doing the social media for the Build Day Live, and we've had uh, Linda Sim in the room with us doing the, the Cohesity side of the uh, social media. As always, my awesome producer is sitting behind <laughs> the cameras. Uh, Jeffrey has, has been powering through, as Mr. Powers does, uh, all of the production and all of the post work. Whenever we finish our day of being in front of the camera, it's the second day of, uh, Jeffrey has to start his second day of being in front of the video editing. Ton, tons of stuff that needs to be done. And uh, yeah, but it, it, it's all worth it because it's a great time. And, and to get you guys educated with this stuff, is, it's just amazing. So thank you guys for watching. And indeed from me also, thank you for joining us. Uh, do get in touch with us if you think there's a vendor that you'd like to hear from. And uh, we, we certainly will start approaching vendors that uh, our, our listeners would like to hear and see Build Day Live events for. And of course, if you are a vendor who would like to have a Build Day Live event, also reach out to us. At, uh, uh, I'm Alistair at um, thebrownbag.com. Uh, I think, thank you very much, particularly Barath. Uh, for being with me for the whole three and a half hours on camera. Uh, I know you're used to being in front of people, uh, but this is a fairly intense event. So thank you very much for joining me on camera. Uh, you guys are awesome. It was great working with you and, uh, and just bringing the, the authenticity and just tangible workflows to our customers is, is, is so powerful. So uh, thank you for all, helping us do that. It's, it's been our pleasure and all of the, uh, the challenges of, of doing the stuff live and uh, the, the sweat through this week of making it all work as we've been in town. Thank you all for joining us. This has been the Build Day Live here at Cohesity. Uh, stay in touch with us and remember to head back to builddaylive.com slash cohesity for more of the content that we've produced. <laughs>